rowdy bunch of entomologists. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, can I have your attention, please? It's like a, it's like a rowdy first year lecture in here. What's going on? Oh, we're having too much fun, I think. Right. So, um, when we uh, were tasked with with running this conference, we had in mind some of the grand challenges set by the Royal Entomological Society, and we were interested in having themes that related to things like insect declines, pollinators, conservation, pest management, and um, we're very happy to here to have. Um, Professor Ellie Ledbeater from Royal Holloway. Her research ties together many of these themes. She's worked on impacts of pesticides, but chiefly um, uh, social memory, social learning, cognition, communication, many, uh, many of the great hard topics in behavioral ecology. And today we're going to talk about cognition and fishing foragers. Okay, <clears throat> hello everybody. Uh, it's very nice to be here. Thank you very much to the organizers for inviting me. It's lovely to see Karmuk in the sun, which is apparently a once in a lifetime experience. So uh, yeah, um, I'm Ellie Levita. I study, um, well, all sorts of things as Ben said, but today I'm gonna to talk about animal cognition, which is my main interest. And when I say cognition, I'm not talking about anything particularly complex. I'm talking about all the ways in which animals gather information from their environment, store it, process it, and decide to use it. So that can be anything from really simple stuff, such as associative learning, can be the basic phases of memory, different time phases, can be things that we think of as maybe more complex, like social learning or executive functions, or it could be something collective, so ways in which groups make decisions that are kind of more than the sum of their parts, so where they filter the behavior of individuals. So that's what I mean by cognition, and what I'm specifically interested in is why it varies so much across the animal kingdom. So why do we see so much diversity? Because animals vary an awful lot in these abilities. There must be some ecological tasks which are really demanding in terms of cognitive abilities where it pays to invest in them, and some where it doesn't, where the costs of investing them outweigh any benefits. So I'm interested in what those ecological tasks or environments or variables are, because we really don't understand what drives this diversity. We don't really know very much about the patterns which explain the evolution of cognitive traits. And so I've always done this using one particular scenario, and that's the challenge that faces foraging social bees. So I'd like you to just put yourself in the kind of footsteps or whatever they are of a, of a worker bee for a moment and imagine yourself foraging in this wildflower meadow. Now it looks like a great place for a foraging bee, right? It's a wildflower meadow, it's kind of the dream. Um, there's an awful lot of flowers out there, but remember that every flower, if it contains nectar at all, only contains a really tiny amount, right? So as a foraging bee, you have to visit hundreds of flowers in order to fill your crop. And because you're so sure, you don't just stop when you're hungry, you go back to the nest, empty everything out again, and then carry on and carry on, ad infinitum to the end of your foraging career, right? So there's a lot of scope for making that kind of thing more efficient. And the useful thing about bees, at least bees in temperate landscapes, is that they, they complete this challenge in a lot of different scenarios. So sometimes they might be, oh, here I'm using mouse. <laughs> oh my god. I'll oh, forget that. I won't, I won't point at it all. You can see. So you might be doing this in a kind of rich, diverse landscape where there's loads of food available and lots of different species that forage on, you've got to decide between them. Or you might be doing it in something more sparse, yeah? So somewhere where it's really hard to find food, where patches are kind of really um, widely dispersed. Or it might be something where there are some patches that are really, really good, really rewarding, really juicy patches like this, obviously, rape field. Or an urban or suburban garden scenario, 
where there's a lot of diversity, a lot of small patches, right? So we have all these different kind of environmental challenges. And that's the kind of varieties um, that, uh, that I'd like to capitalize, or that I capitalize on in, in the research that, gonna, that I'm gonna talk about. So there's two different uh, types of cognitive trait that I want to talk about. First of all, I'm gonna talk about a trait, that, a, trait a study, that uh, involves looking at the benefits of individual learning and memory. When is it useful to invest in memory? And the second is looking at a more collective form of cognition, and that's dance communication. So obviously that's relevant to honeybees, looking at when is dance communication actually useful in the real world? What is it really helping with? What is it that probably drove its evolution? I don't know if you've ever thought about it, why is it that dance communication only evolves in honeybees? It seems incredibly useful. Why doesn't it exist in even a single other social insect at least? So there must be some, something special about the, the foraging niche of honeybees, which renders that important. So I'll start off by talking about individual learning and memory. So just to remind you, I'm looking at when is individual, when are, when is individual memory used? So, this is a study in which uh, we used foraging bumblebees and the types of environment that we were um, comparing were rich spring environments. So this is uh, on our campus. There's an awful lot out in the spring. There is a, a big diversity and it's very easy for bees to find food. Whereas if when we go through to the summer, it becomes a lot greener, uh, but a lot less colorful. It's a sparse, harsh environment for bees. So the sun is famously quite a difficult time for social bees to find food. So we're interested in how useful memory is in these two different types of environment. And how we did this, I'll talk you through for one colony, just to show you at first. So we have a colony arrive in the lab, and this is a colony raised from an aseasonal queen. So these are queens that we've sourced commercially. They've been in the, in the commercial stock for generations and generations. They have no idea what time of year it actually is. And they're a small colony, and we standardize all these colonies when they arrive. So we make sure they have no parasites. We feed them all the same way. And we test the memories of bees, of individual foragers from that colony. And I'll tell you about how we do that in a moment. But once we've done that, what we do is we allow the colony to forage outside. And this colony, colony A, is foraging in a spring environment. And we measure the foraging efficiency of those foragers. So we can see are the bees that score well on the memory test, are they the ones that are foraging most efficiently? So we do that for colony A, but then we do it all the way through the year for two years. So all of these colonies are all arriving in exactly the same state with exactly the same amount of uh, food given to them, etc but they're allowed to forage in different landscapes. So how do we do that in a bit more detail? Well, I said I'd tell you about how we tested memory, and I've been using the word memory in a really generic way so far. What we actually test is a form, a very short-term form of memory, or working memory, in some you might call it. This is a raised alarm maze that's adapted for bees. So raised alarm maze was originally developed for rodent toxicology studies. Um, but here we're using bumblebee, so the bee enters through the central um, part here, and then she chooses which arm to go to. So let's say she goes to this one. Then she extracts a small drop of sucrose from behind the hole. She can't see it, right? She has to stick her tongue through to get it. So she does that, and then maybe she goes on to another arm, so this one. And then once she's taking the sucrose from there, then she has to make a choice, right? She has to decide, do I go back to this arm, which is empty, or do I go back, do I go to an arm that I haven't visited so far? So we can count the number of errors that she makes, the number of revisits to arms that she's empties as a measure of her short-term memory. And there's three things that I want to say about that maze. The first one is that the bees know the rules, right? So we have trained each one to asymptotic performance. They know that the, the arms are not rebated once they're once they're filled. The second is that you can solve that maze by, or you can do really well in it by um, 
follow a stereotypical rule like just turn left all the time. Yeah, so that would <clears throat> uh, that would help you. Please do use those rules. I'm not going going to go into now how we know that they additionally use memory, but I'm really happy to talk about it afterwards if anyone is interested. We know that they use those rules and they additionally use memory. So it is a test of memory. The third is that you could very obviously easily solve it by using sent marks. We change these platforms every time we do that. Yeah, so, <clears throat> so we're confident that it's a test of the uh, short term memory. This is what it looks like in the lab, and I should point out this is Chris Paul, who's a postdoc who did most of this work. So the bees are tested in this raised on maze, and then they forage outside. So this is the area surrounding our uh, our campus. Um, if this is where our uh, bees are released from, and they they can forage in suburban gardens. There's also parkland. There's mixed woodland out there, and every time they go out. Lucky Arena measures the uh, their weight when they leave and their weight when they come back. Yeah, so we can measure their foraging efficiency. And she does that all the way through their foraging career, which she really enjoyed <laughs> for two years. Um, okay, so we have memory, we have foraging efficiency. What did we find? Just to remind you of what we predicted here. So each of these um each of these blocks is a month of the year going from spring to summer on the y-axis this is foraging efficiency so the higher it is the better and on the x-axis this is your memory score it's transformed that's why it only goes from zero to two and um, remember here that a low score is better because it's fewer errors right so we have predicted something like this. We predicted that in spring, when it's easy to find food, everybody should be able, everybody should be quite an efficient forager, right? And um, uh, whereas if while we go through to summer, when everything becomes sparser, or it's a more harsh environment, that's when we expect the memory uh, the, uh, the benefits of memory to become more apparent. So what did we find? Well let's look at April 1st. April wasn't quite as we predicted, so we uh, here we found that the bees that scored better on the raised alarm maze, those are the ones that were foraging more efficiently, which is quite exciting, even though it wasn't what we predicted. Uh, and then we go through the year, and we find actually a complete reversal in uh, what we'd expected. So really, we found that the complex, uh, abundant environments are the ones where memory seems to be making a difference towards the end of the year when it's hard to find food. Actually, it didn't help at all. Actually, it seemed to be quite a bad thing to have a, a good memory. So first of all, let's have a, before trying to think about why that is, let's just have a, a look at that data. The first thing you might think of what is, well, this is all correlated data, yeah? It's a nice pattern. But we haven't done anything. We couldn't manipulate the bees' memory. We couldn't put them in groups where we said, okay, you guys are going to get good memory and you guys are going to get ladies are going to get a, a bad memory. So perhaps there's a third variable here, something else which just correlates with your memory score and which is explaining foraging efficiency. Now, of course, there's loads of stuff that explains foraging efficiency. We measured everything that we could think of. And some of them do predict how efficient a forager you are. So, for example, time since release, that's your experience. Yeah, these become get better and then they get worse again. So they get to know their environment and then they age and get not, not as efficient anymore. Bigger bees are better foragers. We already knew that. The weather predicts how efficient you are, you're better when it's cooler, etc. Um, and there are other variables that we put into our, our analysis which have no effect. None of these were collinear with your radial arm maze score. So we were really careful to make sure that there's nothing that correlates here. That doesn't mean that there isn't something else, right? Something that we haven't measured. But it would have to show that same complex pattern where it predicted foraging efficiency in the spring and not in the summer. So, so far, we think we can be reasonably confident that this is something which is reflecting an effective memory. The second thing is that I've made the assumption that the spring is a rich, diverse environment for bees. But remember, I said we're in a suburban area. I don't know if any of you know where Royal Hallway is, but it's surrounded by suburbia. There's loads of gardens and people plant flowers for colour 
at every, but they want it through the year, right? So we wanted to check that our assumption was correct. We went out and we did ecological surveys every week through our experiments to um, see how many genera were in flower. This is divided up by land use. Um, on this axis, we've got generic rich richness, so in other words, how many genera are in flower, and this is through the year. And you can see that although gardens are a bit different, so we had a peak kind of in the late spring, Generally, the pattern was that there are fewer species in flower as we go through the year. We also looked at foraging efficiency, which I haven't put up here, general foraging efficiency. We saw a general trend towards bees taking longer to fill their crop with the same amount of nectar towards the end of the year. Although I have to say in, in October, it went back up again, probably because they actually came out, I don't know. Um, uh, but generally, we saw everything going down. We looked at the pollen that they brought back, and we found colonies in the spring were bringing back loads of different species, whereas colonies in the summer, there was one colony that only ever brought back one species. So it does look like that, that, that we were correct to uh, assume that the uh, spring was a complex, that uh, abundant food sign. Okay, so why why do we find this? Why was short-term memory predicting uh, foraging efficiency in the spring and not the summer? And the, the answer is that honestly, we don't know. Yeah, this isn't what we predicted. Um, but we think it's probably to do with the type of memory that we were trying to capture. So this really short-term memory is probably useful when you're foraging within patches, right? It's not, not for movements between patches. It's useful for remembering uh, how much nectar the patch currently contains and deciding should you leave. Remembering the flowers that you've been to potentially. We don't know, but we expect it's, it's to do with that. So <clears throat> we're going to start here to be foraging within a patch. Um, so within patch foraging, why should that be more important in the uh, in the spring than the summer? Well, potentially. Patches are much richer in the spring, right? You can you go out and you find a patch close to close to your colony, and you spend all your time there, and then you come back. That's just a guess, yeah. What this study does is open up a lot of questions about what bee foraging is really like in the spring. Um, so what we've done is found a pattern that memory seems to be more useful in these uh, complex and abundant environments. And what we'd like to know now is is why. It's still an open question. Sorry. Okay, so uh, I said I'd talk about two different aspects of cognition. And first of all, I've talked about individual learning and memory and talked about how at least this one small type of memory, short term memory, seems to be more useful in a complex environment. I want to go on now to talk about dance communication uh, as a form of the uh, of collective cognition, collective decision making. Okay, so any talk about dance communication, it has to start with a picture of uh, Carl von Frisch and his labor home, it's obligatory. Um, famously, Carl von Frisch was awarded one third of the Nobel Prize in the 1970s for his astounding work on the honeybee bridal dance. Does that count as a studio of your medicine, I think? Um, I'm sure this audience knows what a waggle dance looks like, but to relieve your mental load, I will show you again. Um, so here's a dancing bee. Yeah, this one with the uh, green and white dots. And you can see that she's performing waggle runs that go generally from this side to that side. And the duration of that waggle run informs the other bees how far she uh, they have to fly to uh, to find the food. And the orientation of it relative to the top of the hive, so remember that this is the vertical surface, um, tells them what direction they have to fly in. So she's dancing at approximately nine o'clock to the top of the hive, right? So that means go out, look for the sun, turn through nine o'clock, what's that, 90 degrees? Um, and uh, fly in that direction. Yeah, the most astounding form of, uh, of animal communication. I mean, I remember learning about this as an undergraduate and just being wowed by the fact that that is. So, <clears throat> as I put, 
as I mentioned, Carl von Frisch got the Nobel Prize for discovering this behavior, but his journey there was not particularly smooth in any way in terms of uh, his scientific work and in terms of uh, the circumstances surrounding it. So he was working in Germany in the 1920s and the 1930s, he first described the Wagel Dance in the 1920s. That wasn't an easy time to be working in Germany, all right? And von Frisch lost his job at one point because the authorities discovered that he had a Jewish grandmother, so he wasn't considered somebody who should be working in a prominent position by, um, by those in charge at the time. He was reinstated because his colleagues were so um, outraged that he'd been dismissed um, because his work was considered of national importance. If it is, obviously, if you're working on Wagle Dance communication, we all need to know about that. Um, so, uh, uh, yeah, but then the, the institute that he worked in was flattened. He'd campaigned for years and years to build this institute. It was flattened in one day by bombing. So he, he carried out most of his work in his back garden in Austria, which um, is amazing, right? You know, imagine if you had to only had your back garden to work in. I think there's a, a bigger back garden than my back garden. It would be bigger than all of our back gardens, but it's still. Uh, quite an amazing achievement. Anyway, scientifically, he also had quite a troubled journey. So what was relatively easy for von Frisch was to persuade the scientific community that the dances of the bees correlated with the food, that the locations that they had visited outside the, the hive. That was easy to show. What was harder was to show that uh, the follower bees were actually using that information. And the reason for it is this. So if you imagine a hive with a load of feeders around it, let's say these are 100 meters or so from the hive, and you train a cohort of bees to this feeder, then it's easy enough to show that they go back to the hive and they dance, and the other unmarked bees from the hive turn up at that feeder more than they turn up at the other feeders, right? But what's really hard to rule out is the, or deal with is the fact that those foraging bees, they produce scents, even I can smell them when they're foraging at these feeders, they produce durinol, they smell of bees, and, and that feeder itself has its own scents associated with the environment around it, right, so that those bees carry back to the hive. So von Frisch's critics always pointed out that actually the bees could be using scent instead of carried out lots of experiments to show that actually scent was a really important driver of this behavior. So this is a problem for von Frisch, and there's one famous experiment that probably quite a lot of people have heard of, probably other people haven't heard of, but I think it's a beautiful experiment that was, um, that finally, fortunately before von Frisch died, got rid of this, uh, this challenge for him. And that was an experiment by James Gould, who was a PhD student in California at the time, to run this beautiful experiment. What he did was he effectively persuaded the dancing bees to lie about where they had been. So he did that by painting over their acetylene, so their light sensitive cells on the top of their head. He would train uh, dancers or a cohort of bees to, let's say, this feeder, and then he would effectively blind them, they would go back to the hive, and what they wouldn't realize because of this blinding process was that there was a light on in the hive. So remember that bees orientate towards the top of the hive, treat that as though it's the sun, but that's not the case if you've got a light on inside the hive, right? It makes sense, there's a big light in the hive, so let's treat that as the sun instead. So these bees were orientating towards the top of the hive, Whereas the other bees, the followers, thought that they were orientating towards the light. So then effectively, Gould managed, managed to make it so that the dancers were indicating a feeder that they hadn't been to. You know? And so <clears throat> Gould showed that, um, uh, that recruits turned up at this feeder more often than would be expected by chance, and therefore finally showed but yes, the followers must be using the dance communication rather than this sense, because scent was indicating this feeder. And I thought this is a beautiful experiment. Really, really lovely. And then, <clears throat> uh, go back. And what it shows is that bees can use the dance communication, right? It shows that when everything else is equal 
and no feeders, and all the feeders contain several sucrose and are all equidistant from the hive, and they all have the same concentration of sucrose, they use dance communication to find a feeder. But the problem is the real world doesn't look like that, right? The real world looks more like this. There are a huge number of different food sources that all smell different, that are all at different uh, locations, that all contain different uh, rewards or different concentrations of nectar. So there's all these different cues coming into the hive. Scent is a major driver. And that's what caused Bulls, when he wrote up this paper, to say, in a bit that the textbooks kind of tend to overlook, he said, the inherently spectacular nature of the dance language may have helped to emphasize it out of all proportion to its actual place in ecology and foraging. Only further work can establish whether the dance language is common or real under normal circumstances. Yeah, so what he's saying is, I've shown that these can use the dance language. I don't know, or dance communication, I don't know if they do use it usually. That's the question that we attempted to answer um, <clears throat> in the research that I'm about to talk about. So when do these actually use dance communication? And there's two parts to that question. First of all, <clears throat> we want to know when do these use dance communication rather than scent. And the second is, if you think about dance communication, it doesn't really matter what individual bees are doing because the unit of selection is the colony. So we want to know when does dance communication make a difference to how the colony actually forages, how it allocates its forages. Okay, so let's start by thinking about when do bees use dances rather than scent. Okay. Here's, oh, I forgot one to press this. There we go. Here's a dancing bee uh, inside one of our colonies. And you can see that she's dancing, she's got loads of followers, but there are also other bees around her that are antenating her, not necessarily following the dances, and um, but getting nectar samples, et cetera. There's one right at the end of the video. Let's just play it again. Okay, so she's dancing away, she has these followers here, but then she's gonna go and give a nectar sample right at the end to a totally different group of flowers that are there. So there's a little trophallactic interaction there. So we've got dances going on, we've got trophallaxis, and we've got a bees antenating each other, which is how they <clears throat> smell what is on each other. And these dances are taking place all the time. Sometimes it's when the bees are going to new food sources, but some, I mean, most of the time when, bee, when a bee follows a dance, she already knows where she's going. Yeah, she just follows the dance anyway before she leaves the hive. So we have these different contexts when she's being recruited and when she's being reactivated to a food source. All these different times when bees could be using scent or they could be using the dance. And in the way that we looked at this, um, or the way that we try to compare how important the dance is to others is by using a technique called network based diffusion analysis. And it works like this. So if we, if we build a social network based on dance interactions, so imagine this bee visits the feeder and she goes, she dances and these bees follow her. Then they go out, they find the feeder, they come back, they dance for the feeder. Yeah, so maybe they dance and these bees follow them. You can see how we can build a network, right? And the basic assumption of network-based diffusion analysis is that um, <clears throat> if a behavior is being transmitted socially, then it will follow the connections of that social network, right? So. Uh, in this case, the behavior is arrival of the feeder, so it should be traceable through this network. But the nice thing about it is that we can compare different networks. Yeah, so this same B, oops, sorry, I'll have to in a minute. This same B, uh, we can build a, a network based on her trophallactic interactions as well. Yeah, so <clears throat> at exactly the same time, exactly the same kind of a uh, communication phase. Um, she's, <clears throat> we have a different network, a slightly different network based on triple axis, and we can also build one based on antenation. And we can compare these three networks and see how good they are at um, predicting whether 
she arrived, or whether individual bees arrived to feed it. I haven't got the maths for the how network the this NVDA, how it works, um, but basically it can be summarized as the probability that any individual in this collection arrives at the feeder can be modeled as a baseline rate of just finding the feeder by the cell. And then if social transmission is important, it should also depend on the number of connections that you have to informed individuals, these that have already found the feeder and then factored by this factor S, which is just the strength of social learning. So how important, how, how likely a, a dance interaction is to send you to the feeder. Okay, so we have these three different uh, networks. Just to show you how we, oh, how we did this in uh, real life. So this is Matt Parsenjäger, who um, actually carried out the empirical work. What Matt did was train the cohorts of bees to a feeder. Um, mark all those bees, and then they went back to the hive and they danced and they formed, uh, formed a triple axis and they were antenated by other bees who filmed all those interactions. Those other bees are bees that are looking for a new feeder to be reactivated. They've never been to this feeder before. Um, and he built a social network based on those interactions to see who arrived at the feeder. Okay, so what did he find? Oh, yeah, you, sorry. you can imagine the feeder as a, a, I imagine it as a flowering tree, right? It's a really rich resource. And these bees have already been at another flowering tree and it's um, it's uh, it's now empty. It's become underwater. Ah. Oh, well, there we go. So here, <clears throat> we're looking at the recruitment bars, which are the, the um, red dots here. Um, this is the dance network, this is the trophallactic network, and this is the antenation network. And this is the percentage of arrivals at the feeder which are explained by both. So you can see that in the dance net, in the case of the dance network, this is explaining 95% of the arrivals, uh, or about 95% of, of the arrivals at the feeder. The trophallactic network, although it's doing, although it's taking place at the same time, it's explaining nothing. Yeah, so a, tr a trophallactic interaction doesn't make any bee uh, more likely to arrive at the feeder. The same with antenation. And so this is really strong evidence that it's the dance, not the scent cues, which are driving the bees to the feeder in this context, right? But if we look in another context, remember I said that the bees were most of the time following uh, dances when they already knew where the feeder was. This is the time, so this is the blue dots, this is the time when the scent networks actually become more important, right? So here, the dance network starts to um, uh, explain only uh, less than 20% of the arrivals, whereas still the scent cues aren't explaining all that much, but it's a lot more than they were explaining before, right? The rest is explained by this individual discovery rate. So it looks like the dance that we've, we've kind of answered the question of whether is the dance important under normal or what was it, real or normal circumstances? Well, yes, it is in the context of recruitment to a new feeder, but most of the time, when the bees are following the dances, uh, they are using scent cues instead. Yeah. But specifically for recruitment to a new feeder, the same species, um, it's important. So that leads to the second question, the final question, which I'm going to go through quickly, of when, when does that actually have an impact on colony foraging patterns? When does that change the way that the colony forages? And what kind of environments do these switches are, are they are they common? What do I mean by colony foraging patterns? I mean something like this. So this is a map, radius is two kilometers here. And um, this is the honeybee hive at the center. And these are the foraging locations that have been identified through dance decoding. So uh, doing the same as the bees are doing, using von Frisch's equation to work out where they actually go. Um, uh, it's a heat map, so the red bit is the bit where most of the bees are. So what we're asking is, when is this pattern any different 
because the bees are using mass communication to how it would be if they were just all going out and scouting for food by themselves. The first thing that we have to do to answer that question is we have to know what these foraging patterns actually look like. We need some observed foraging patterns, right? So that's where my former PhD student, Ash Samuelson, um, comes in. What Ash did was set up observation hives at 20 different locations across, uh, sent all the way from central London to um, the agricultural land surrounding London. And there was a, a lot of variety in the landscapes here, but Ash specifically targeted agri-rural environments and central environments. And uh, Ash videoed the dances that took place when every two weeks, again for two years during the foraging season, and decoded all those dances, which is a really mammoth foraging effort, to produce these maps of where the bees are foraging. So we have now, we know what the foraging patterns look like. What we want to know is, are they being driven by dance communication or not? So to do that, we need a model of what they would look like if they weren't, and a model of what they would look like if they were. And that's where <clears throat> these people come in. This is a PhD student, Joe Palmer and Vincent Janssen, who's a math particle biologist at Royal College of Leeds. Vincent and Joe built a model to, uh, that assumes that, or takes, oh, what did they do? <laughs> it, uh, it, uh, it assumes, well, I can't even think of the word. Anyway, uh, it assumes that colonies contain bees that um, perform scouting trips and bees that are recruited by these trips. This doesn't mean that there are bees that are scouts and bees that are recruits, right? It means that some trips are scouting trips and some are recruit trips. So a scout goes out and looks for food, and a recruit is recruited to a, uh, to a uh, foraging site. Now the distribution of distances that those two types of trips follow are different, yeah? So the scout trips look something like this. So this is cumulative frequency on the y-axis. This is the distance that they're traveling. Most of them are close to the hive, but some are quite far away. Whereas the recruit trips are all closer to the hive. Why is that? Well, that's because of a property of the dance communication which makes it into collective cognition, which is that naturally the colony filters the, the dances or the sites which are advertised. That's because the scouts, if they go to a site which is taking a lot of energy to get there, they perform fewer waggle circuits when they get back. Now they still indicate the location of the site, the distance and the direction, but they just don't indicate it for as long, which means that fewer recruits bump into them and fewer bees are recruited to that site. It's a really beautiful kind of uh, emergent property of the, of the dance communication system. So we have these two different distributions. And what Vincent and Joe did was combine them to make a model of what a colony should look like if we if we take a if we assume that a proportion of the trips are recruit trips and it looks something like this we look at the red line here so again this is cumulative frequency up here this is waggle dance duration sorry that's um uh, which equals distance right and we see <clears throat> we get this kind of everything goes down quite smoothly until we get this clump at the end. So this is a combination of the recruit and scout distributions. So we, we can predict what it should look like. And we can compare it to what it looks like if we assume that there's only scouts in the colony, so all trips are all sites are found individually, and it looks something more like that. So the next step is to fit this to the data that we have, our observed data from uh, these, these 20 colonies, right? And you can see here, this is a fit for one particular colony. You can see this colony is showing good evidence of a better fit to the collective model than the individual model. So evidence of a footprint of dance communication. And <clears throat> not really surprisingly, we found that in most colonies, yeah, 16 out of the 20 colonies um, that we studied. So that's great, kind of shows that our model is working. But it's not headline news, right? We already knew that bees use dance communication. So what what is it? What can we use it for? Well, the re 
really nice thing is that, oh, sorry. The really nice thing is that in this model, we have to fit, or the model fits a proportion of the trips that are recruit trips, yeah? That's a way of telling us how much is the colony relying on dance communication. If that proportion is really small, dance communication is really not a big thing for that colony. Uh, and if it's large, then dance communication is being really important. So that gives us a kind of measure of how much of the dance is the colony relying on dance communication. We look at our different landscape types. So up here, this is vital dance use, i.e. reliance on the communication. And we generally classify them into urban landscapes and agricultural landscapes. <laughs> and we can see that in the urban landscapes, the general trend was towards a lot of waggle dance use, right? Whereas in the agri-rural landscapes, we saw an awful lot more variation. And we can look more closely at that variation and say, well, what is it? What, are, what landscape features are driving this, um, uh, this reliance on dance communication? And <clears throat> so here we have, again, waggle dance use on the y-axis. And this axis, well, it's, it's, a, it's the results of a PCA, but you can think of it as being urbanness. So it's how much built up area was in, the, um, in, the, um, in that particular site. And you can see that generally, waggle dance use seems to increase with the amount of, uh, yeah, basically <clears throat> how urban the area is. So this is data, it's only from 10 colonies. Yeah, it's not, um, I wouldn't say this is a, this is a conclusive data that the viral dance is, is being used more in urban environments, but it's definitely looking that, comp uh, uh, looking, it's definitely looking that way. So what is it about the urban environments that might be important? Well, if we think about what are urban landscapes like, they are really pretty good for social bees, yeah? It's easy to find food, we know that. They're diverse, we also know that because we've done the pollen collections again and the identifications from rural versus urban colonies, we know that they're foraging on more patches, more, uh, more species, sorry. And we know that these are the same kind of complex, they're a bit more like spring landscapes than they are summer landscapes. So, the general trend seems to be towards waggle dances being more important in these complex, diverse landscapes than they are in sparse landscapes where it's hard to find food. And this is something that, you know, is, is a start. This is what we want to move forward with. And now we have automated dance decoding. We don't have to have what Ash has been there for two years, decoding dance uh, communication, et cetera. Um, uh, but yeah, that's the pattern that we're finding. So just to sum up, I said I was going to talk about when is individual learning or learning and memory important. It seems to be at least short-term memory is important in complex landscapes. So perhaps complex landscapes were important in, the, in driving the evolution of that particular memory phase. For dance communication, we have initial data and a beautiful technique. Um, to explore when is dance communication actually important and what was it about the evolutionary landscape in which uh, honeybees evolved, which made this fantastic communication system, uh, which drove its evolution. So that leaves me just to thank you all for listening and thank the people who did the work, so Chris Paul in particular, Matt Lardenega, uh, and Ash Samuelson and Joe Parr. Um, thanks very much. Okay, so uh, we have plenty of time for questions um, on the floor. So, uh, as per our normal protocol, we do encourage um, any researchers and students to start off the uh, questions. So, um, um, I was really interested in your um, sort of memory stuff and how it's actually more identified in sparse environments. 
was wondering if there's any sort of there's any trade-offs between sort of neurological capacity required for um, memory and maybe physiological traits which are better for certain environments. Well, yes. I mean, uh, the answer is I did think that there would be. So we found no. We we also measured survival there. So we all our bees were RFID chips. Uh, and and um, we found no effect on survival at all. But then, if you think about it, this is really short-term memory, yeah. And short-term memory um, doesn't require transcription. It doesn't really require anything other than neurons firing. So I would say for short-term memory, no, probably not important detectable costs. If we tested long-term memory, which is what we'd like to do, um, uh, then possibly there might be because that actually requires energy and there's evidence for trade-offs with other survival traits in Drosophila. I mean, so um, maybe. <laughs> Thank you. Really interesting talk. Thank you. Hello. Oh, well. Um, thank you very much for talk. Very interesting. Uh, I was wondering about the sort of sequential colonies, um, and if you know how related those are to each other. If I'm understanding correctly, the different colony each time based on the one you've got in. I was wondering how related those are, and whether maybe there's genetic differences might. Make up some variable. Um, in terms of how related they are to each other, well, we don't know, but they're all from commercial stock, so they're probably slightly more related than the than the you know random colonies from the general population would be. Um, I can't see that there would be any particular pattern though, in terms of us having used particular. Uh, you know, particular genotypes at one end of the year and uh, and others in the early season. Like, um, I can't see why it would be, but if you can, then let me know. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so um, I was interested in the slide you showed where you showed that uh, foraging efficiency improves with age to a certain point and then declines. And I was kind of wondering how the waggle dance fits into that. So is a naive honeybee, do they, do they inherently know exactly how to waggle dance and what it means, or do they, is it a learning process? In the waggle dance communication? Yeah, um, yeah, so that, that is something that I've kind of been interested in for a long time. Um, I don't think it's really been uh, necessarily answered. I mean, uh, definitely, you know, they do kind of emerge having a good idea of how to use the waggle dance. And, and we know that because it's naive bees that tend to follow dancers in more, right? So presume, but nobody's really looked at how their success rate improves. And um, there is some evidence uh, from Christoph Bruter's lab where um, what they did was they made it so the dance, the dance communication was actually useless. Yeah? So they disorientated the hives, put them, made them horizontal. And so the dancers were meaningless. And they showed that the, the bees started to rely on them less. So there probably is a, a, some aspect of learning in there, I guess. Um, but yeah, I don't think it's really been examined properly. Like, oh, well, not properly, fully. <laughs> but, Thank you. Thanks, Ellie. Um, I just the, the stuff at the end and looking at the, the urban landscapes and the madman landscapes made me wonder, um, and I don't know anything about the history of domestication of, of honeybees, but I'm wondering whether um, A, that their ability to respond to what I guess would be disturbed, so a lot of these sort of complex plant habitats often may disturbed habitats, that kind of sort of thing, um, which also, you know, human activity historically would have created even, you know, a long, long time ago. So whether either the ability of honeybees to be very good in you know, human influence landscapes was part of helped them be good to be domesticated, or vice versa, um, you know, we kind of helped them get better at that by providing a landscape that the particular skill of, of, of the waggle dance and began to respond to these sorts of landscapes actually mm. improved. So whether we I mean I I I, I, say I don't know how long we've been 
domesticating it, but whether we, we've even selected on more efficient waggle dancing because we create landscapes where it's very useful. Hmm, yeah, I haven't, I haven't thought of it in terms of domestication. Uh, so, I mean, the, the landscape where the waggle dance originally evolved is, is kind of expected to be uh, tropical, right? Tropical rainforest. Um, in terms of domestication, I mean, they've been domesticated for a long time, at least since the ancient Egyptians, right? And I would say that probably it's only in the very latest kind of time that they're foraging in, in kind of suburban style landscapes with these really tiny patches. I mean, before, yeah, I mean, these kind of modern cities, they, they're a very recent thing, right? So, yeah, I don't know. I don't know how much um, they could really have affected kind of what we've selected uh, bees for. But uh, yeah, I mean, I, re I would really have to think about it. Like, I don't know how domestication has affected it. Right. Interesting point. Um, thanks for the fascinating talk. I was curious if the bees being recruited and reactivated by the dancing bee, um, whether with their antenation would pick up any residual floral scents on the, the dancing bee and whether they use that once they get the location indicated. Yeah, uh -huh. so um, that's exactly what we're expecting that the antenation should do. And there, there is work showing that it, um, that that's what happens basically, you know, that they don't even need the sucrose reward. It's not like they need to smell it and via their antennae and then um, uh, get the sugar via trophallaxis. Just smelling it is enough to drive them to, to that particular food source. Um, so yeah, that's what we we're hoping to pick up. And it wasn't quite as important as we as we thought it would be. Although it's still more important than trophallaxis, interestingly. Okay, interesting. Thank you. No questions on the Clinton side, but Thank you. Okay. Um, this may be a sort of question, but did, how do these use buzzing to communicate? Is that something that's incorporated for dance, different frequencies? I'm pretty sure I read a paper once that uh, said honeybees buzz when they bump into each other. Or they can basically they say oops yeah. when they when they hit each other. Yeah, yeah. Um so uh, the answer is yes, they do. So that's um thought to be one of the main um uh, I mean for us it's very visual, right? But obviously not for them, they're doing it in the dark. And so yeah, the uh, that's how they kind of detect the second duration of the waggle run, like how long did that buzz go on for? Um in terms of the bumping into each other, uh they do the but they're not saying sorry, they're saying stop dancing. <laughs> Right. So that's another of the of the signals that they have, the stop signal, which is basically like if they've been attacked when they're outside the hive, then they come back and find the dancer that was dancing for that food source and the, do the stop signal. So yeah, you're right. Yeah, past the critical enough. Hello, uh, lovely talk. I, I'm interested um, from a sort of conservation perspective because we're obviously um, interested from a pollinator perspective to conserve sort of a, a, a diverse a pollinator community. And honeybees are moved around and put into different habitat types mm -hmm. um, and, and forage in those um, differently and then compete with um, other pollinators that are there. So my question is whether um, you've noticed waggle dance to be less dominant in populations that have been moved around and put into almond plantations or or orange plantations or have actually been surrounded by a very homogeneous um, habitat mm. and and whether that is then less of a you know of a, of a mode of finding your resources because they are everywhere and then the, there's less need for the honeybees to do this and whether that then affects obviously their competitive advantage um, with other bees yeah in communities. um so i mean absolutely it does if, if this and holds true, then it, it looks like it is less important in uh, in monotonous landscapes like the kind of you know armed orchards or whatever that you're talking about. And um, I guess the thing is, it's not necessarily that they're losing their advantage, though. It's that the individuals. Well, it's not that they're becoming less effective. Um, it's that the individual search is just as good, right? So it's like individual search can, can do the same job 
So I suppose if you're comparing with bumblebees, for example, then uh, yeah, in that case, I suppose honeybees should have less of an advantage over uh, because they can't recruit them, doesn't really help them in that context. So yeah, sorry, circular, arguing against my own argument, but yeah. <laughs> We'll just have the mic for our, oh no, you go ahead, then I'll leave the mic. Thank you. Thanks very much. Yeah, um, just a quick question about the first experiment. Um, so you talked about measuring the pollen diversity that was in the landscape so like coming back to the experimental hives. I'm just wondering about the pollen volume and the bees' capacity or um, need to go out foraging for pollen during the experiment, and whether, in fact, if those bees that were perhaps coming back with bigger pollen loads were actually at that time starting to exhibit less efficiency net collection, so they've come behind the trail. Mm -hmm. um, that, is that something we can measure or it might help explain more expected results? Um, um, yeah, so, in, so the, one thing that I didn't make clear was that these trips are all next trip trips, so we got rid of them. Even if, if the bee came back with a very tiny amount of pollen that could have just collected, you know, just by chance, I think. By chance, but yeah, um, uh, then it was included. But otherwise, all the uh, pollen chips were excluded, and we did that because we didn't expect um, memory to be very important for pollen because it's so easy to see if the plant has pollen and the flower has pollen, right? Not always, but um, we expected it to be much more important for nectar foraging. So, um, yeah, does that answer the question? I think it does, doesn't it? Yeah. I just think the mic for a line question. Uh, so we've got uh, got one question from Anne Duploy. Uh, does the dance itself or dance use change based on the resource type brought to the hive? For example, if pollen or nectar of one flower type is more or rich or more important. Oh, whether pollen or nectar is more important. Yes, uh, or does the dance? No, it doesn't. And it's interesting that it doesn't, right? So uh, pollen dances are similar to nectar dances. Um, interestingly, that was one of the um, main problems for von Frisch. And, sorry, I'm talking to you, Ben. Yes, well, just there, there, all there. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, uh, so von Frisch originally thought that round dances, which are, are dances that bees perform when they're really close to the hive, and he thought that they indicated um, uh, pollen resources. Um, and he was very upset with himself um, when he discovered that they didn't. It was just because of his own experimental design, right? The bees that were um, flying to the next feeders were flying a lot further. Yeah, so they were performing the um, Bible dances. But if you put pollen and nectar at the same distance, then the dances are the same. Brilliant. Um, so uh, as for yesterday, we have um, a meet the speaker session uh, during the coffee break. So if you want to come and meet any personally, we're going to be hanging out in or near seminar room D, so you can bring a coffee and, and have a chat. And then um, what remains is to thank Ellie one more time for a really great talk. And, and thank you. Thank you. Thank you.